Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, it has been <coughs> an absolutely wonderful privilege to be with you this weekend again, and uh, I really hesitate to embark on this final talk. Um, I hesitate to talk because it is so obvious that the Lord is speaking to each of us individually. And as yesterday, I pray that in talking, as I've been asked to do, I will not intrude between you and the Lord. We have a very small and very welcome complication this morning because, of course, at 11 o'clock, we want to join with the rest of our nation and many other nations in remembering those who gave their lives for us and it's entirely appropriate that we should do that and so with the help of a special timekeeper who's asked me not to name him uh, <laughs> but, but it'll be obvious I'm relying on heavily I will stop uh, at the point <coughs> at 11 and we'll just observe the two minute <coughs> silence and one or two thoughts. I also um, am not at all certain that I should re revert to my ghoulish humour this morning, but I think probably one or two uh, are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going to tell the joke about the Welshman living in Scotland and <laughs> <laughs> until Jan Evans was mentioned. I, s I say that he was a Welshman living in Scotland, so that if the accent goes wrong, you won't be, you won't be absolutely certain which bit of it was genuine. But there was this uh, Welshman living in Scotland who was a backslider. And he was also handsome and young, and there were two ladies in his life, um, and he was trying desperately to decide which he should marry, and they were putting pressure on him to come to a decision. One was called Maria and the other was called Stephanie. And he really was coming under very considerable pressure. And uh, in the end, he went to his old church, which happens to be quite a high church. Uh, and he went inside and he said to the Lord, I've got this problem here, Lord. I've got to decide between Maria and Stephanie. Which should I have? It's getting very difficult. You notice that the Scottish <laughs> residents had <laughs> altered his accent a bit. <laughs> Should I have Stephanie or Maria? I don't know how he expected to be guided by the Lord and certainly had no right to be, but he knelt at the apse as he prayed this prayer. And when he got up, his eyes raised to the archway above the apse where he read in beautiful old italic English, Ave Maria. <laughs> I, I think that's probably enough of the humour for today. <laughs> so, uh, we come to the third talk. We've discussed the completed work of Jesus as our Saviour and we've come back to that theme so wonderfully and so supportively in all that we have done, particularly yesterday. It's a day I'll never forget, I think, yesterday. It was, it was so helpful from start to finish. And um, I'm sorry for those of you who, uh, who weren't here. Uh, the, the second talk that I gave in the evening was the continuing work of Jesus as our leader. And if you remember, we were discussing that part of our lives which starts when eternal life begins for us and runs parallel to our physical life. And I quoted the example of Liam McCluskey. I was sitting at breakfast this morning with our Ghanaian, three of our Ghanaian friends, and uh, we were recalling the fact that um, in about 1955, um, a man called Joshua Hamidou came to Sandhurst. Actually, his name was Muhammad Hamidou in those days. He'd been brought up a Muslim. And while he was at Sandhurst, he was led to the foot of the cross by the Military Christian Fellowship. He became a Christian, changed his name to Joshua, and became Joshua Hamidou. 
You never know, do you, how important your witness is to people. Joshua uh, went back from Santos as an army officer. He was very successful. He became chief of the general staff, the head of the army. And then in Ghana there was a coup. And Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlins, bad enough that it should be an airman, but <laughs> 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 to be a Flight Lieutenant, it's a bit pushing. Anyway, if you remember, Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlins had a coup and uh, it was probably needed, one doesn't know. But as he came to power, Jerry Rawlins began to lift stones and look underneath. And wherever he lifted those stones, he found corruption. And I think all the chiefs, uh, and Emmanuel was uh, on the, in the newspaper world at that stage, and he bears out all that I say. Uh, all the chiefs, I think, were found to be corrupt. I say chiefs, I don't mean chiefs of tribes, I mean chiefs of the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Armed Forces. And everyone was corrupt until the stone was lifted for Joshua, and there wasn't a piece of corruption to be found anywhere, not a single piece. And uh, Jerry Rawlins made him his chief of the Armed Forces. And so that portion of our lives that we are living in now where eternal life and physical life are running parallel is so hugely important and the walk has got to match the talk in all our lives so if we are great speakers or if we're very silent it doesn't matter because our witness is in our walk as well as our talk and so that was last night. And now we come really to the most chilling uh, phase in this plan that stretched from before the world began and was quite detailed in its layout before the world began and goes right on to what we're now going to look at, which is the Lord's second coming and all that followed it. God, says John in 5.22, has entrusted all judgment to the Son. We heard in that beautiful reading, Caroline read so clearly, it is not the, that God judges us, all judgment has been given to Jesus. How can this be? Well, as far as we Christians are concerned, when God looks at us, he sees Christ which is nothing to be proud of, but it's a fact. And we've had um, a number of illustrations of this, and I, I, I think of another which might just help us a bit. We had from Howard this morning the thought of the crossover, if you remember, and I was talking yesterday about the evangelism explosion illustration of the Lord laying all our sins upon Christ. And there is a third, isn't there, a third element in this, because here were we, burdened down, with the obstacle of our sin and here was Christ clothed in righteousness and what happened at the cross was not only that the Lord laid all his iniquity upon Christ but that he also took all the righteousness of Christ and laid it upon us. Amen. We are told that we in Galatians 3.27 we are dressed in Christ, we are clothed in Christ, we have put on Christ. And so when God looks at us, he sees only Christ. Christ's righteousness, we are under the blood. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? So we are quite clear about our title. It is the committed, because it's been committed from before time began, that Jesus should be our judge. And we'll see in a moment just what that involves. What Jesus will do for us and with us at his coming and afterwards. When will this be? We do not know. Thank God we do not know. What pattern will it take? We have some clues. We can't be certain but the clues seem to be fairly strong. And uh, I would like, if I may, gently to work our way through them. 
the first event that we seem to be faced with when Jesus is committed work as a judge begins is his second coming. His second coming is going to be a big surprise. It's covered in 29 books of the Bible, no less. Eight books in the Old Testament, all four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles by Luke, <coughs> ten of Paul's letters, the letters to the Hebrews, the letters of James, Peter and John, and Revelations. All of these books, 29 of them, insist that when Jesus comes a second time, his appearance will be clearly visible. It will be a visible return, a real physical return. Could someone please read Acts 1 verse 11? Thank you. That's just one of many verses that insists that he will go as he went physically, he will come back physically and visibly. <coughs> when it will be, we don't know, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. We just don't know when this will be but it will be visible and it will be clear. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 7 Thank you. And in majesty, Luke 9, 26. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter... Which Luke 9, verse 26. So his coming will be visible and it will be in great majesty, it will be physical. What is more, no less than 16 books of the Bible and 54 verses insist that the souls of the saved will accompany him. That's a pretty exciting thought, can't wait. The souls of the saved will accompany him in this, what is, what is called the first resurrection. There's a second one. But the first resurrection, we will <coughs> accompany him. And terribly good news for those like my elder son who is severely epileptic, they will be given imperishable and perfect bodies. Hmm. It's great news, isn't it, for those of us who are getting more arthritic every day. Imperishable resurrection bodies we'll have. Fifty-four verses in the Bible insist on that. Christ and the saved, which is us, if our names are written in the book, and this is all, I'm afraid, very bad news for those whose names are not written in the book, Christ and the saved will meet up with the living in Christ. So there's going to be a great coming together. And this is sometimes referred to as the church celestial and the church terrestrial. Coming together. What a party. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 4. 14 and 17. Don't bother to look it up. The church celestial, we with Christ, and the church terrestrial, those who are still alive on the earth but have been saved, will come together. 
So the second coming is very well attested in the Bible and is a very positive factor. I think we've just got time before we stop for a moment to look at the second event, which is getting a bit closer to home. The judgment of the works of true Christians. Hey, hang about, I thought we weren't going to be judged. Ah, it needs some uh, careful thought here. This judgment of the works of true Christians, which is a bit chilling, uh, one of our lady members said to me the other day, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to this, because it's sometimes called a prize giving, but as we read on, it's not all going to be quite as much fun as a, as a prize giving at school. Could someone please, just before we stop, read John 5.24. Very good news, and we'll come back to it after the break. <coughs> so let us just stop there for a moment as the whole country, including our wonderful sovereign who we don't pray for nearly enough, uh, stands at the National Memorial. I think if we could stand... The words written on the memorial at Kohima, which could so directly apply to the Lord Jesus himself. When you go home, tell them of us and say, it was for your tomorrow that we gave our today. Let us just stand in silence as we think of those who did sacrifice everything for our freedom. They shall gro grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Guns of the King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery are sounding in London. So John insists in chapter 5, verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes on him who sent me already has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has already crossed from death into life. So what's this then about a judgment? We're, we're told that it's the one occasion when true Christians will stand before Christ to be judged, but not of our sins. Because in Hebrews 10.17, please, and in Romans 8.1, Hebrews 10.17 and Romans 8.1, That's pretty clear, isn't it? And the other reading? So, those are absolutely unmistakable statements, aren't they? And what a comfort, but it's not a, not a let out, as we shall see in a second. Because instead, of being condemned for our sins which are now not visible to God and which Jesus himself is not going to judge us for, we've, we've, we've been told. Instead of that, we are asked to give account of our lives. <coughs> for the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he or she has done. That's what brought the comment yesterday. I'm not sure I'm looking forward to that. <coughs> um, our beautiful Christopher, who is filming all this, 
gave me a wonderful illustration yesterday, and I'd like to uh, use it. At this hearing, this assessment, our lives will be not, f well, fast rewound to the start and then played back. It's not a good thought, is it, really? We will not be condemned, and there's a wonderful verse which we, we, we have yet to read which proves that, but we will be reviewed. Each person's work will be shown for what it is, says Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 3, verse 13. Don't look it up if you don't need to. I'll read it to you. Each person's work will be shown for what it is. It will be revealed with fire, which will test the quality of each person's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. There go the guns. <laughs> if not, he will suffer loss he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. This is pretty solemn stuff, isn't it? So we are by no means excused this assessment. We will not be condemned. Never again will we be condemned for our sins from now onwards, if we believe. But we will be assessed, and it may be quite painful and we will escape only as through the flames. Paul also says in his second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him or her for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Still no condemnation from God, but some pretty profound assessment. And in Revelation 22.12 we read, Behold, I am coming soon, my reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he or she has done. And then there are various mentions of the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, and that wonderful remark, well done, good and faithful servant. <coughs> now this shouldn't make us miserable, it should make us determined. We are, thank God, spared condemnation, but we will be assessed. I think particularly within the AMCF, a one one couple in particular. His name is uh, Bob Reifschneider. He's a colonel in the American Army. He was a jump colonel. Uh, he's fallen out of more airplanes than we've had early breakfasts. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife, Billie Jean, are so tremendous in their purposefulness as evangelists. They have just run a marvelous, what we call Interaction East, which is having leaders from all the different countries, including Colonel Odati, from Ghana, who is the commander of your staff college at the moment. And they've just had two weeks together, uh, waiting on the Lord, praying, praising, teaching, looking at inductive Bible study and all these things, uh, and then going around various camps in America. And such is the wonderful nature of the internet that each night around the world we got a report of that day with photographs on the website. Isn't it marvelous how we can use the internet now? So we knew exactly how the day had gone. Just 48 hours after that, they were off to Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Venezuela. They're just so alive and on fire. He happens to be fluent Spanish speaking, brought up the son of a, of a missionary in South America. Now, I'm quite sure those sort of people are going to have the most wonderful crown of righteousness when they're assessed. But that's what we should aim for. <coughs> and there are some solemn words in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 and 27. They should give us pause for thought. 1 Corinthians 9, 
25 and 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Mm. Having preached to others <coughs> that I might be disqualified for the prize. So this is no sinecure we're talking about here. It's deadly serious. For all that, we must cling to the promise which the Lord Jesus gave to the thief on the cross, who, let's face it, hadn't exactly got his star for good performance and was far too late to change it. And what did Jesus say to him? This very day you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. So we mustn't get um, uh, unhappy about it. Uh, Freedom from condemnation is absolute, but it's pretty serious areas that we're treading on here. And thank God, when he looks at us, when God the Father looks at us, he will see only Christ. Now, the story does get rather more solemn. For the next stage, as we understand it, is the great tribulation and the rule of the Antichrist. So we're, we're now in the final stages of the plan, which has started before the world began and is coming to the New Jerusalem. The great tribulation and the rule of the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit of Christ and we, the saved, have departed this world. And lawlessness is free to reach its climax. This is made very clear in a number of scriptures uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 10, of those, for those of you who are making notes, is worth looking at. Sin will abound. Antichrist will reign. It's a nasty thought, isn't it? I'm glad that we won't be around, those of us whose names are in the book. But, and there's always a cheerful side to this, during this period of Antichrist, a great multitude will be saved during this tribulation. That's made clear in Revelation 7, 9 to 17. We, ne we needn't look it up. Uh, and also, for those of you who are making notes, Revelation 13, 11 to 17. The first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 18. And Matthew 24, 21. Are all relevant. And what happens at the end of this period of the Great Tribulation? There's an enormous battle at Armageddon. Not less than 12 books in the Bible talk about that battle bringing the Great Tribulation to an end. And then the news gets better again. We enter into the millennium. Not the year 2000 with big domes built on the South Bank and the Thames, <laughs> but the millennium. We're on the move again, so we must travel light because we are going with Jesus and all his saints, while Jesus reigns on earth in person. For a whole millennium, a thousand years, Satan is bound. He's not finished, but he's bound. And Jesus will rule as Messiah. There are no less than 20 books of the Bible which deal with this subject, 63 verses specifically, and we, the saints, are going to have a marvellous thousand years. We will enjoy the most intimate communion with God. Twenty books of the Bible stress this, 114 verses. It's also well documented, all of this. The kingdom will centre on Jerusalem and its temple, and Satan will be bound completely for this time. But thereafter, he will be released for a short time before finally being cast into the lake of fire. Uh, for those of you who want references, Isaiah 72, Revelation 34, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Satan finally is cast into the lake of fire. 
what a joy that's going to be because I don't know about you but I think he's he never switches off as far as I'm concerned I think David Watson once said some people say that Satan's dead but if he is I'd very much like to know who it is who's going on with his work <laughs> particularly after being on a mountaintop as we've been this weekend. Now here comes a very different judgment, the judgment of the great white throne. Eleven books of the Bible talk about heaven and earth passing away and in this judgment of the great white throne all who are dead will be raised. This is called not the first resurrection but the general resurrection <coughs> And at this stage, the ungodly, that is, those whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, will be sentenced to the ultimate hell of the lake of fire. A second death, and a more painful one than the first. Thirteen books, sixty-five verses, specifically talk about the ultimate hell of the lake of fire, which we, thank God, will be spared. And amongst those who are condemned, we read, there will be Jews. Luke 52 and Matthew 37. In the book that you've so enthusiastically taken of 100 days, you will find Sir Arthur Smith very strong in this area. And I commend to you particularly his studies um, around 95. And Sir Arthur writes, Perhaps you feel that this is unfair, that they will be finally condemned to the lake of fire. And he writes, he is a God of justice, remember, as well as a God of love. And he also says, how could an ungodly person survive in heaven? Which is an interesting thought, isn't it? And he also writes, God is merely allowing the state of separation from himself to continue after death. We're nearly at the end of this amazing plan of which we today are such a vital part. Christ finally offers up his kingship and his role as judge to God the Father. Paul writes of this in the first letter to Corinthians chapter 20. And so we come finally to that high ground from which on Friday night we started to look back over the course. And we are in the new heaven and the new earth. What do we read about it? In five books of the Old Testament we read that God will rule over Israel forever. In Psalm 37, Micah 20, Luke 14, the Messiah will be eternal. It's going to come as a tremendous shock to a lot of Jews to find that the Messiah is Jesus after all. Mashiach, Yeshua, I don't mean to laugh because it's not their fault in a way. As we read in Romans 11, our eyes are blinded to the fact that Yeshua is Mashiach that Jesus is the Messiah. Thank God if our eyes have been opened to that truth. But for them who wait for the Messiah every Shabbat, every, every Shabbat, they believe that this will be the Shabbat when the Messiah will come. And every night when you can no longer thread a needle, on Saturday night, as a Jew, your throat is dry, you feel low and depressed because once again, Shabbat has passed and the Messiah has not come back. We read that the righteous will be gathered into this blessed new Jerusalem, Revelations 14. There'll be a healing of all the nations, Revelation 4. The redeemed will enjoy eternal fellowship with God. Six books make that point, and I could give you the references afterwards if you want them. And so we come to the conclusion. We don't know when we will be able to stand on this highest ground of joy and triumph. But we are assured in the most explicit terms that we will be. And I quote, at long last the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh 
shall see it. All things, all things will be put in subjection under him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. How wonderful it would be, wouldn't it, if every knee and every tongue in Westminster, in our Parliament. When the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ who will reign forever and ever. And when we look back along this critical path as we've tried to do, not only in my talks but in everything that has been said and shared this weekend, we shall surely focus depending on who we are and what our background is, and we've, I know we've got two lovely Jew, Jewish people in this room. Uh, one of them didn't discover that she was Jewish until quite late in her life. They're both, of course, Christians too. When we look back, we shall focus on the Old Testament and its struggles. We shall look at Jesus, our Saviour, and the wonderful things he did on the cross, defeating sin and death. We shall focus on Jesus as our leader at this stage where he longs to lead us more than we are ready to be led, where we have to practice the attitude of depending upon him for his instructions, where we have to wait. And I've had some marvelous conversations since last night about this attitude of doing everything under his direction and seeking actively to be led by him. And finally, surely, we must focus upon Jesus on the judgment seat, restoring all the heavens and the earth to his own control, overthrowing all evil at last, and bringing about the final destruction of Satan, and finally delivering up the kingdom to God the Father, exactly as was planned before the world began. Aren't we privileged? Isn't it amazing that we cannot share this wonderful truth, this well-documented truth, this truth which we personally are experiencing? Isn't it amazing that we can't share it more effectively and efficiently? I know the Koreans, we talk about the Korean factor. There are so many of them. There are 12 million just in one tiny capital. Uh, we went to church there uh, just about this time, a little bit later than this time last year, and one of the churches we visited had seating for 27,000 <laughs> and four overflow halls, and they were broadcasting instant translation and, and, uh, in seven languages and broadcasting by satellite to Korean churches in Japan. And that was only one of seven services in that day. And the whole of that part of Seoul came to a standstill so that the church had to provide extra policemen to control the traffic. And the, their academy, their military academy, reckons that by the time they're commissioned, uh, well over two-thirds of their cadets are all born-again committed Christians. <laughs> and they really, really take it seriously. And mustn't we also, if that's how the Lord leads us, and if we don't ask, He'll never show us how. So aren't we really the, the lucky ones because we have a product as salesmen and saleswomen that cannot be equaled anywhere in the world. And what are we doing about it? So may I finish my section? I know uh, the service will go on, but may I just finish my section by suggesting that we bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to look, as we believe we have, on the best evidence we have from your holy hill, back along the panorama of your plan. So to see more accurately where we are along that route. And my prayer, and I believe the prayer of most of us here, Lord, is that you would make us more effective and more fruitful. That you would teach us the discipline of pray and plan which we all resist and find excuses for and are helped if, we, if we're hesitant by the devil in finding other excuses. Help us, Lord, to get your perfect plan 
for each of us in our outreach and our fruitfulness. And we're reminded, Lord, that if we're not great speakers, that doesn't matter because indeed our lives speak much louder than our words. And so please help us to witness and help us to expect fruit, Lord. Help us to be fighters for you, freedom fighters. Help us to know our enemy and to study him. Not to become obsessed by him, but to know his wiles. Keep us, Lord, in your strong arms. Fill us with the Holy Spirit which you long to provide in greater depth. Lord, help us to be active in Christian witness and service, but we're reminded by John yesterday morning that we must be also very careful about overcommitment. So help us to be in balance, Lord. Help us, Lord, to put right any wrong relationships because this is a real obstruction to using us. We are at war, Lord. Help us to remember to put on the armour of God every day. Help us to be constant in prayer. Help us to have spiritual discernment. Help us to remember the festal shout, the Lord reigns. And finally, Lord, the prayer that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, that it might apply to us too. For this reason, wrote Paul, I kneel before my Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love which passes knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now writes Paul unto him, who by his power within us is able to do far more than we ever dare to ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church, through Jesus Christ, for ever and ever. Amen.